Hi there, Mark Nelson here, pastor of Plains Evangelical Church. Glad you could join us as we share God's word with you today. Uh, we're going through the Gospel of Matthew just now. We've been doing that for some time. So let's turn to Matthew chapter 22 and we'll read verses 15 to 46. Matthew chapter 22, verses 15 through to 46. Then the Pharisees went and plotted how to entangle him, how to entangle Jesus in his words. They sent their disciples along with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are true and teach the way of God truthfully. And you do not care about anyone's opinion for you, for you are not swayed by appearances. Tell us then, what do you think is lawful? Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, Why put me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin for the tax. And they brought a denarius. And Jesus said to them, Whose likeness and inscription is this? And they said, Caesar's. Then he said to them, Therefore, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. When they heard this, they marvelled, and they left him and went away. The same day the Sadducees came to him, saying, who, who say there is no resurrection. And they asked him the question, Teacher, Moses said, if a man dies having no children, his brother must marry the widow and raise up the offering for his brother. Now there were seven brothers among us. The first married and died having no offspring left, and then went to his brother. So to the second, and the third, down to the seventh. After all the women, after all them, the women died. In the resurrection, therefore, of the seven, whose wife shall she be? Wh whose wife will she be? For they all had, for they all had her. But Jesus answered them. You are wrong, because you neither because you know, know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. For in the resurrection they are neither they neither marry or are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. And in the resurrect as for the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was said to you by God? I am the God of Abraham, I am the God of Isaac, I am the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. But when the crowd heard this, they were astonished. But when the Pharisees heard this, they were silenced. They, they had silenced the Sadducees and gathered together. And one of them, a lawyer, asked a question to test him. Teacher, what is the greatest commandment of the law? He said. Jesus said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. The second one is like it. You shall love your neighbour as yourself. On these two commandments depend the whole of the law and the prophets. Now while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them a question, saying, Who do you think the Christ was? What do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? They said to him, The son of David. He said to them, how then is it that David wrote in the spirit, calling him Lord, saying, the Lord has said to my Lord, sit at the right hand and I will put enemies under your feet. If then David calls him Lord, how is he his son? And no one was able to answer him a word, nor, nor from that day did anybody dare ask him any more questions. Well, we trust the Lord will help us understand his word for us today. If you were to draw up a list of questions and you knew that you would be given the answer to each of your questions, what questions would you ask? Google and Alexa have become an integral part of our question asking today. In 2020, the following appeared on Google's top 20 searched questions. Number nine, what time is it? Number six, how many ounces are in a cup? Number five, when is Easter? Good to see a, a Christian one in there. Number two, which dinosaur had 500 teeth? Seriously, 
The second most asked question that people want to know is which dinosaur had 500 teeth. So what was number one? What should I watch? With so many different forms of multimedia to watch, so many different channels and mediums to watch through, we are just all the more confused. What should we watch? Well, we're back in Matthew's Gospel, looking at Jesus' final week, the week that we've come to call Holy Week. So called because it's the climax of Jesus' perfect ministry on earth. And every day Jesus would go into the temple and every night he would return to Bethany, a village outside the city, to stay with his friends Mary, Martha and Lazarus. And in our reading today, it covers the third temple visit that would have taken place on the Tuesday of Holy Week. We started looking at this last time. And last time we saw three illustrations that Jesus gave showing how God was moving his work beyond the Jewish people because they have rejected his ministry. And in verse 45 of Matthew 21, we read, When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they perceived that he was talking about them. They were guilt-ridden. And what follows after that is four interactions between Jesus and the religious leaders as they tried to trap him and separate him from the crowds who followed him, trusting him in him as a prophet sent from God. And within those interactions, Jesus, the, there are four questions asked, three of, whom, three of which came from the Jewish leaders to Jesus and one came from Jesus to the Jewish leaders. So let's listen into their conversation and see how this applies to our life today. Question number one, should we pay our taxes? I'm sure that's a question that most would love to ask God and would love for him to come back and say, no, you shouldn't. So what was Jesus' answer to this question? Well, Jerusalem was at this current time under Roman rule. And Roman rule at this time was a relatively peaceful rule. The Romans were there, they laid down their civil laws, and religion on the whole was never much affected by those civil laws. The Jews were free to worship as they pleased, so long as they kept their civil laws, namely this one surrounding the paying of taxes. This was the area that would disrupt the peace in Rome if the two came together, if the, the church and, and the, the Jews started to teach that uh, they didn't have to pay their taxes. This would have started a war. And it was in answering this question, in answering this question, Jesus knew what their motives were. But he identified, as he identifies, that there is peace because taxes are paid. And God is worshipped freely. And both occur in two separate entities. Now where the problems lie is when you come to bring these two entities together. When you make the paying of taxes a church matter or worship a government matter. Even today, we still see this same problem. And we still see that there should be distance kept between the church and state. Now, historically, where the two have overlapped, there have been major problems. And this has been seen especially today as the government are laying down laws and guidelines that are affecting the way in which we worship as a church. It's people, and people are starting to ask the question, should we bypass the laws of the land? in favour of the law of God. Now in Scotland recently there was a judicial review made by a few churches addressing this very matter. It was challenged, it challenged the government applying the coronavirus laws to the practices of worship in the church. And the result of the judicial review was that the church and the state should be kept apart, so it should be down to the church to decide how the coronavirus laws are applied. And as a result, that word law was changed to guideline. The government would give guidelines, but not laws. Now, for the sake of future interference, this may have been a good move. However, we must look at the motives that we have if we go on to challenge the government on current issues. We should ask questions like, is this a direct attack on the church? Or is it a law that's applied to everyone that so happens to overlap in church life? We should ask questions like, does it stop us achieving a greater good? Or are we missing a greater good in fighting against it? When it comes to the current guidelines being given to the church, we need to ask ourselves the question that 
Well, just because God has given us freedom, should we use it in the current context? Or how is rising up against the government affecting our witness to the unbelieving world? Is it attracting them to the gospel? Or is it making them think that Christians expect to be treated different than everyone else? These are the current issues that the church is facing today. But these are issues that will always be faced in this world. They happened in Jesus' day. So we need to ask ourselves these should I questions very carefully using wisdom, scripture, thought and prayer. God has given us many freedoms as citizens of his kingdom, but he's also given us authorities to govern us here on earth. Sometimes our authorities may appear to be interfering in church life and with the way in which we worship, but sometimes it is God using them to allow us to enjoy the kingdom more, to depend more on God, to open up more opportunities to serve him. The Bible teaches us much on the subject of submitting to authorities. It tells us to pray for our authorities. It demonstrates people who got involved in civil governance in order to turn them to God. Paul writes at length at how we should submit to our authorities even in the face of persecution. The Bible teaches that a Christian should resist a government whose laws work for evil or against the commandments of God. But this latter one comes with a couple of conditions. When this happened in the Bible, when people turned against the government or the, the laws being passed down, the person resisting it either had a way of escape or they accept their punishment given by their government. And it's important before we go down this path that we use that God-given wisdom to find the balance between reaping the consequences and looking for a greater good. Premature actions or overreactions could damage gospel witness in the long run, so we need to give it much thought. Second question that is asked is, what is the resurrection? Now, two out of the four questions are asked by the Pharisees, but one question came up by another group called the Sadducees. The Pharisees and the Sadducees, they made up what was the Jewish Sanhedrin, the Jewish government in Jerusalem. The two groups both came together as part of the Sanhedrin. They both honoured the law of Moses, but they did have some distinct differences. The Pharisees, they were more liberal sect who believed in man-made traditions alongside the words of God. They believed in the words of the prophets that the Sadducees didn't. They believed in an unseen spiritual world, including angels and demons in heaven, the resurrection of the dead, and everlasting life. But the Sadducees were a more conservative sect. They interpreted the word of God um, only through the first five books of the Bible, known as the Pentateuch, the writings of Moses. And they interpreted the writing of Moses literally through logic, what they could see. And because of this, they denied the spiritual world and everything in it. More importantly, they denied the resurrection of the dead, holding that death was the end of both body and soul. And it was to this teaching that they brought their question to Jesus. The Pharisees, they didn't agree with them in their theology. But if it was this issue that was used to trick Jesus and make him slip up, then they were happy for them to run with it. Now, this is still true in our world today, that common purposes, whether for good or bad, can often unite opposing groups. So the Sadducees come to Jesus and like the Pharisees before him, they address him as teacher. Now, they have no desire to be taught by Jesus. They're trying to trip him up. They're trying to get rid of them. But like the Sadducees, like the Pharisees before them, they use flattery to try and do so. Now when we speak to people, whether that is just in general day-to-day -day chat or the sharing of the gospel, people should see the real us, both in our words and in our deeds. They should not see the person who we think that they want to see. Now Jesus could not only see through their flattery, 
but he could see through the group that they represented. More importantly, he could see their hearts. But Jesus was also happy to run with it for the good of those who are listening. For the time's sake, I want to bypass the historical meaning of the customs that are spoken here in their story. But the hypothetical situation is, if a woman's husband dies and she remarries and the situation repeats itself as much as six times, then who would be her husband in the resurrection? Now, the Sadducees didn't all of a sudden believe in the resurrection. This is worded in such a way that it was a challenge on resurrection theology. Jesus actually does the same thing in the next question, as we shall see in just a minute. They were trying to disprove the resurrection through their own logical minds. And herein lies the problem. If our minds are too liberal, like the Pharisees, then we become overloaded with so many conflicting views. If our minds are too conservative like the Sadducees, then we become so narrow-minded that we cannot imagine anything outside our own understanding. Even the existence of God would be called into question because God is visible as a spirit. Sometimes our minds cannot work out the logic of what is before us. Sometimes we have become overloaded by what is before us. But it is in situations like these that we must come out of our own minds and put uh, and put our faith in God, who does exist, who can resurrect the dead, as Jesus goes on to teach. He presents two ways in which the Sadducees have gone wrong. First of all, Jesus teaches that the Sadducees have ignored scripture. In Luke's account of this encounter, Jesus said, the dead are raised. Even Moses showed it. You know, the Sadducees didn't hold the words of the prophets uh, as the Pharisees did. So Jesus goes right to the teaching of Moses, right to the words that they have accepted. And he highlights the greatest characters recognised by all of Israel. That is Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, the forefathers of Israel. Now repeatedly throughout Moses' writing, he identifies God as the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. He uses this language speaking of them in the present tense, as if they were still alive. That's because of the resurrection. They are still alive, albeit in an unseen spiritual realm. You see, the Sadducees, they accepted the truth of Moses, but they had missed Moses' teaching on the resurrection because they had dismissed the spiritual world. Now, for us today, we don't have the writings of Moses in the lives of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob to reveal the resurrection. Well, we do have them, but we don't rely on them. Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, they pointed to a greater revelation in God's word. A revelation where God himself would be revealed in human form. Only this time, he wouldn't be revealed through subtle language hints. Rather, he would demonstrate his resurrection power. But for us today, we have this as historical fact. Later that week, Jesus went on to prove his own words when he said, I am the resurrection and the life. He went on to die on the cross, to rise again three days later, showing that resurrection was not just possible, but showing that he was the God of resurrection. Jesus' word, Jesus is God's word personified. If we ignore Jesus, then we have ignored the scriptures just like the Sadducees did. The second thing that Jesus highlights that the Sadducees have ignored is they've ignored the power of God. Not just through the act of resurrection, but the way in which God transforms the resurrected person into something that is not of this world, but something that is so much better. Paul writes this at length. Uh, on the subject uh, in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Summarising it, Paul says that in the resurrection there will live a united community under the glory of God for eternity, where there will be no death, no dishonour, no weakness. To sum it up, there will be no sin, where there will be, where we will live in the perfect image of Christ before God. Now if we cannot allow our minds to explore that such a place exists 
that such a power is possible, then we ignore the entire power of God. We shouldn't expect anything from him in return. Question number three. What is the greatest commandment? The Jews had 613 laws that were written down by God, well, they were written down by Moses eh, in the law of God. In addition, the Pharisees also had a number of traditions, man-made laws that they often equated with the law of God. Now, realistically, it was impossible for any one person to keep every single one of these laws. In fact, David, eh, who we'll talk about in just a minute, one of the greatest characters in Israel's history, broke all ten of the Ten Commandments at once. So if David can't keep one commandment, never mind ten, then what hope is there for anyone else? The floor now turns back over to the Pharisees. And one of them asks, what is the greatest commandment? Now, it was impossible for them to keep them, keep all the laws, but nobody would admit that they would fail to keep one. So they could have turned the attention around and say, what is the greatest? In the hope that Jesus will single out one law and then separate it from the rest, thus tricking him. But they were not ready for the answer that Jesus would give, which was twofold. In the first part, Jesus quotes from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5, the law, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. It was basically a repetition of the first commandment in the Ten Commandments. Now this became a mantra for every good Jew. They would recite it twice daily. It encapsulates the entire law of God. Devotion to this commandment showed devotion to the entire law. But the problem was the Jews had become more interested in becoming devoted to the man-made commandment and the reciting of the laws in scripture than observing the law itself. If they did that, then they would soon realise that they couldn't keep any of the 613 laws and that they needed to depend on a power greater than themselves, the power of the coming Messiah. And this has become the logic of many religions and belief systems today, including some people's view of Christianity. That if we do this and we don't do that, and if we forget to do this or not do that, we can say this or say that, then we become satisfied in our own heads that we have done what is required. Now the laws of the Bible exist to show us what we should be like, but they also exist to show us what that our sin prevents us from getting there on our own. And it is in reaching this point and recognising that we cannot keep the teaching of the Bible on our own strength, that we then turn to the power of God, who can make us into who we should be, through the power of Jesus. Now, Jesus could have stopped here. He said enough to answer the question. They couldn't come back on what Jesus had just said. But he doesn't stop there. And the reason for this is because the Jews that were before Jesus had forgotten about a pretty major commandment. Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18. Love your neighbour as yourself. Now, their ignorance to this law was demonstrated in their adverse relationship with the Gentiles, the non-Jews, the people who they were supposed to be demonstrating God's kingdom to. Jesus later repeats uh, this to his disciples by saying, a new commandment I give to you, that you love your neighbour as yourself, that you love one another. Now obviously this commandment's not new. Moses records it in Leviticus. But it's through the example of the Jews' inability to keep it that Jesus is teaching that we should not keep laws just for the sake of keeping laws, but that we should keep them for the sake of our love for others. Jesus said that it was by this that others will know you are my disciples. Religion, it's all about personal devotion to God. Faith in Christ, being a Christian, is about demonstrating your devotion to God by your service for others. So in quoting these two commandments, Jesus is basically saying here that all of the laws of the Old Testament can be categorised under two headings. Laws about loving God and laws about loving others. If they kept these two laws, then they would keep all the laws. The final question 
is, who is the Christ? The floor is now open for Jesus to ask the final question. He should always have the final say. And so Jesus' question in verse 42 is, who is the Christ? Now, whilst the leaders ask Jesus questions maliciously to trip him up, Jesus asked this question to reveal himself as the Messiah. But in doing so, he does trip them up in their own logic. But this is what needed to happen in order for them to hear God's truth. You see, sometimes we need to challenge our own logic to enable God to come in and work in the areas of our life where we have become so hard-hearted to his understanding and his truth. The answer was uh, to this question of who is the Christ? Uh, who, is, who is Christ the son of? They say the son of David. David was the first good king, the first good king of Israel. He was the one that received a special covenant from God, saying that the Messiah would come through his line, that the Messiah would rise to a royal position. Now Jesus then quotes David from Psalm 110 verse 1, a well-known psalm to the Jews, speaking of the coming Messiah. In it, Jesus reveals that the Messiah would not just be the son of David, but that the Messiah would also be the Lord of David. Now, the qualification of son of David could not be enough to identify the Messiah. That was so that the Messiah could have been King Solomon or Absalom, who tried to kill David, his father. It could have been Joseph, the carpenter from Nazareth. So they needed to consider another question. The question it was, who could David, the greatest king, one of the great heroes of history, who could David call his Lord? Now this is a question that we need to consider for ourselves today. We need to, if we call ourselves a Christian and even call Jesus our saviour, we need to also call him our Lord. And in presenting this question to the Jews, Jesus is saying there is enough in the teaching of David and his life and his writings to reveal the answer. Now for us today, the Bible is a big book of teaching. There's much in it that we can learn. But we can answer, we can only answer the questions, who is Christ and who is our Lord? By looking at the one who not only points to the Messiah, but the one who is revealed as the Messiah. Jesus, our Messiah, our Christ, our Lord. And no, one's, no one then replied to Jesus' challenge to their logic and no one asks any more questions. And the same comes for us today. There comes a time where we need to stop asking questions and look to the Messiah who is revealed to us through the person of Jesus in Scripture. And we need to ask him as our saviour and our Lord. Now we would love to hear your questions uh, for us. So please do email us, pastor at plainsevangelicalchurch.com. If you have any questions about this message, about Christianity, the Bible, or anything else that we might be able to help you with, please get in touch. Pastor at plainsevangelicalchurch.com. Trust that God's word has blessed you today as you've listened to it. And we'll see you next time for the next instalment of Matthew's Gospel.